Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, meant to be a quick breakdown of what is probably one of Musk's worst public performances ever, and there's some very strong competition in that category. This particular embarrassment captured on video was voluntarily posted on the SpaceX Twitter account on April 6, 2024, promising, quote, an update on the company's plans to send humanity to Mars, the best destination to begin making life multiplanetary. This presentation did not appear to be a press conference and did not include a question and answer period like his previous Starship presentations at this venue in 2022 and 2019. Instead, it would appear that the entirety of the audience and attendance were SpaceX employees, who were probably called in on their day off given their total lack of energy in the gallery. So when Musk is pausing, waiting for the adulation that he's used to receiving, we're going to fill in the gaps with this sound. Just four days prior, there was an op-ed published by the Daily Beast entitled, Elon Musk has entered the please clap stage of his megalomania. It could not have been more prophetic or better timed with regards to this half-hearted Starship update. For those people unfamiliar with American politics that may be missing the reference, this goes back to the Republican primaries for the presidential race of 2016, where Jeb Bush had an audience at a campaign event that were less than enthusiastic about being there. Here's what wound up happening. Would send a signal that we're prepared to act in the national security interests of this country to get back in the business of creating a more peaceful world. Please clap. That February 3rd, 2016 event and plea for validation pretty much summed up the level of excitement in Jeb's campaign, and he would never live it down. Only two and a half weeks later, after poor showings in the early primary contests, Bush would remove himself from the GOP leadership ballot. Compared to past Starship events where everyone in attendance was itching to applaud and cheer everything that Musk told them, this event was the exact opposite. The people in the gallery barely reacted at all to Musk's dull plotting monologue. You can tell that nobody was really interested in it because not one person bothered recording the event on their phones. We found the entire presentation to be painful to watch, cringeworthy, embarrassing actually especially when you look at the nonsense that Musk was reading off of his teleprompter. We're not going to go through the entire 45-minute mumble fest. There are stretches of several minutes where he rambles on about extinct alien civilizations. When you think about the question of where are the aliens? Or Starlink, or even trying to excuse Starship failures to date by reminding people of the success of the Falcon program. But we don't let anybody, not even Musk, pull that stunt without pushback. Falcon and Starship are two completely different programs, with no commonalities between them. The success of Falcon does not automatically guarantee the success of Starship, obviously. We will instead cover the notable highlights and revelations as they came in order, because what Musk was telling his audience about this launch vehicle system, especially in the second half of the presentation, was nothing short of batshit crazy. <laughs> in fact, some of the claims he made go back to the very first episodes we ever created on this channel four years ago. And when that happens, we'll be pointing out which episodes we made that covered those points. And yes, we're going to do you the favor of editing out the stammers and pregnant pauses as we normally do with Musk, and you can thank us later. No sense everybody going home with a migraine just because Musk can't speak properly. Setting the scene for this presentation, a video screen and a small stage for Musk, and only Musk, was set in front of three Starship test articles and what some people think passes as an HLS crew compartment mock-up. Although it's obviously too small and we never see inside of it, so it might as well be the on-site lavatory. When Musk begins speaking, this is how he starts off telling the audience about Starship, Mars, and his reasoning behind the need to colonize Mars. What I'm gonna go through tonight is the overall sort of path to making life multiplanetary. Starship is the first design of a rocket that is actually capable of making life multiplanetary, where success is one of the possible outcomes. No rocket before this has had the potential to extend life to another planet. And um, <clears throat> if you look at the history of Earth, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. So that's why I think that there's, a, there's, there's a high urgency to making life multiplanetary because this is the first time in Earth's four and a half billion year history that it's been possible to extend life or consciousness beyond Earth. And we've got to do that while civilization is still strong. 
So that's, that's, that's the overarching goal of the company. Ideally bef before World War III or some kind of bad thing. He used almost identical lines in 2019 and 2022 for those Starship updates. It, it's, it appears that consciousness is a very rare and precious thing. And we should take whatever steps we can to preserve the light of consciousness. And the window, the window has been open only now after four and a half billion years is that window open. There's some chance that window will not be open for long. I think we should really do our very best to become a multi-planet species and to extend consciousness beyond Earth. And we should do it now. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. High degree of urgency, light of consciousness, four and a half billion years, carbon copy with tweaks. And Musk has been using the threat of World War III as a fear motivator for Mars colonization since at least 2015. Maybe he went back to the old material to see if his audience was awake. It didn't work, especially for those people watching from home who recognize all the recycled bits. Musk continues on setting the parameters of what he thinks is required. The, the key thing is that we need enough people and enough tonnage on Mars such that Mars can survive and continue consciousness even if something would happen to Earth. I think this can be done in around 20 years. So enough people and tonnage, he doesn't say tonnage of what, to set up a self-sustaining city on Mars in the next 20 years. But of course you can't just launch from Mars anytime. You have to wait for orbit transfer windows, which only come around every 26 months. And the 2024 one is about to pass Musk by. He'll miss the 2026 window as he's scrambling to make good on his HLS contract. And then we're looking at maybe nine other opportunities before 2050. 2031, 33, 35, 37, 39, 41, 43, skip 3 to 46 and 48. Let's round it up to 10 by giving him the 2050 window as well. Musk has not mentioned the number of people yet. That will come later in this presentation. But it's no secret that Musk intends for his city on Mars to be inhabited by 1 million people. Divided into 10 windows, that's 100,000 people headed off to Mars every 26 months with everything they're going to need to take with them to last the rest of their lives. The crowd remained unimpressed. So he tried to warm up the crowd a bit with a two and a half minute IFT3 recap video, and that was good for about eight seconds of lukewarm applause. <laughs> Continuing on. And congratulations, guys, you did that. That's, in that's insane. I mean, it looks like CGI. I mean, it's hard to believe that that is unfiltered video. That's just the actual what the camera saw. No filters, no nothing. That's actually what the camera saw, which is insane. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, it's wild that, that this, uh, this strange spot, this, we're, we're basically on a sand spit uh, by the Rio Grande near the beach. Um, and uh, that is actually the gateway to Mars. Make a note of that claim because it's going to be revisited shortly. And in case you missed it, here is where it became obvious that the crowd is not members of the press, but rather his own on-site employees, thanks to these comments. And congratulations, guys, you did that. You're doing incredible work, and it's due to you guys. Congratulations. After showing a side-by-side -side video of the three flights to date, Musk goes into what's coming up next with IFT4, which he says is coming up in a month or so, making it May of 2024. And we got uh, Flight 4 coming up in about a month or so. With Flight 4, if fate smiles upon us, uh, we'll get through the high heating regime and smash into the ocean at a controlled spot. And then uh, hopefully be able to also do this with the, with the booster land on a, essentially a virtual tower. If the landing on the virtual tower with the booster works, then we will actually try with Flight 5 to come back and land on the tower. That, that's very much a success-oriented schedule, but, uh, <laughs> but it is in the realm of possibility. But I would say like the, the odds of us actually being able to catch the, the booster with the Mechazilla arms, probably like 80, 90 percent this year. Biggest flying object ever made with mechanical arms out of the air. But we're going to do it. So, yeah. 
Considering that IFT3 failed to land either half of the vehicle as planned, and Musk conveniently skipped over even mentioning the failed experiments on board SN28, there's very little faith that IFT4 will be making out that much better. The virtual tower that Musk goes on about would have been virtually decimated upon impact when shrapnel from Booster 10 smashed into it at Mach 1 from IFT3. At 12.30 into the presentation, Musk pulls this classic out of his hat. So really, a Starship is, is really the key to making life multiplanetary and preserving the light of, light of consciousness. That's what it's all about. It may end up being the most important thing that we ever do. Like the light of consciousness is like this, this tiny candle in a vast darkness. And th that candle has only been lit for a very short time and it could easily go out. A absolutely crucial to that goal is becoming a multi-planet species. When Musk talks like that, he's validating claims made by many media outlets that he has a savior or messiah complex. John Oliver had a great segment about this mental delusion that Musk appears to operate under. And John is also pretty much convinced that Musk is one step away from becoming a supervillain. Because he cultivates an image that he's simply too visionary, too original to play by other people's rules, and he waves away the damage that he does as the cost of innovation and saving humanity. But the truth is, that way of thinking isn't remotely original. We've seen it so many times before. The least surprising thing on earth is a middle-aged billionaire CEO with self-serving libertarian views, increasingly racist politics, and a messiah complex. And this article from 2018 on theweek.com referred to Musk as a messianic huckster. The opening paragraph stating what people had already been whispering about for years. Elon Musk is a goofball tech bro whose real business is quack philosophizing not inventions or engineering. This 2024 Starship update is proving that out nicely. And when Musk is being a quackpot philosophizer, he likes to throw around big words that he can't use properly. Take this quote, for example, on this topic. The future of humanity is going to bifurcate in two directions. Either it's going to become multiplanetary or it's going to remain confined to one planet and eventually there's going to be an extinction event. English majors will recognize that is not what bifurcate means. He probably means to use a variation of binary, as he is implying it will be one or the other. Bifurcation is when something is split into two pieces, but both continue to exist contemporaneously. Going back to this particular sermon, the claims Musk is making are laughable. First, he says, we'll extend the light of consciousness to Mars, and then to the rest of the solar system, then to interstellar travel. Ignoring the rest of the cosmos for the time being, let's think about what it would take to get to Jupiter, the next planet out, and on the other side of an asteroid belt that is 300 million kilometers across. Using the same cosmic train calculator on Clatter.net, the trip to Jupiter from Earth would take two years longer. So plan on bringing three tons of food per person instead of one, just for the voyage there, as well as three times all the other consumables on board, then, once you're at Jupiter, you're not going to be landing on the gas giant. So, which irradiated Jovian moon would you like to set up shop on? Callisto, with only 140 times the daily radiation dose on Earth? Or Io, where radiation on the surface is lethal five times over? And don't plan on using solar energy to power your base that far out, nor plan on making fuel on the surface to get back home. And if you're thinking about heading to Saturn, or colonizing any of the 146 moons circling it, well, that planet's orbit is twice as far from Earth as Jupiter, on average. The front half of this presentation was obviously pretty dull. Things really didn't get interesting for us until around the 15 minute mark, when Musk started reciting numbers surrounding the mission to colonize Mars, and making a bunch of statements that seriously made us question his overall intelligence. Take this statement for example, talking about the key difference between the colonization of the moon versus Mars. People often ask why, why Mars? Well, there's not a lot of options, frankly. <laughs> the moon is close, but it, it, it doesn't have an atmosphere, the gravity is only one sixth that of Earth, and it's missing a lot of key resources. Also, the insulating value of the moon relative to Mars is much less. So if there's something that takes out Earth, like let's say there's a World War III, a, you know, global thermonuclear warfare, they'll probably th th throw a few nukes at, at the moon. <laughs> so 
Whereas it's way harder to, to, to shoot Mars with, with nuclear. And we'd see, Mars would see it coming and probably have some time to stop the inbound missiles. Well, the distance and time required to get to Mars actually has an insulating benefit for the continuation of consciousness, even if there's something terrible happens on Earth. Um, and uh, So much to unpack here. First, let's take on the firing nukes at the moon scenario. Ignoring the fact that according to international treaty, it is illegal to launch or position nuclear weapons in space, let's instead acknowledge that the ICBMs upon which nuclear weapons sit are not spacecraft and would lack the control thrusters required to hone in on a target. It's not like you can just hurl a nuclear missile toward the moon and expect it to land on the pinpoint that you want. Also, the trip to the moon would take several days in space exposing the craft and onboard systems to the extremes of temperature and radiation. Then, on the very extremely slim chance that the weapon even made it to the moon, what would happen if the weapon detonated? Well, nuclear explosions rely on a shockwave moving through the atmosphere to blast their target apart, and the moon doesn't have one. But upon detonation, there would be a blinding flash of light and lethal radiation that creates intense heating in the immediate area. Anybody getting hit by the radiation burst would die instantly without the filtering effect of an atmosphere. The explosion's radiation cloud would not expand on the moon as it does on Earth, again because of the lack of atmosphere. For example, there would be no mushroom cloud, because that requires the atmosphere to act against the explosion, which is what causes the blast wave in the first place. And because there is no air, there would be no convection to carry the cloud upwards, replaced by surrounding cooler air, creating that signature mushroom. Instead, there would be a visible dome that expanded outwards, cooking the surface of the moon into a thin layer of glass until the effect dissipated outwards, leaving behind a small, permanently radioactive crater. But the far easier way to kill a base on the moon would be to destroy the logistical launch sites on Earth, making the act of targeting the moon not only impractical, but also completely pointless. Then, Musk says, Mars would fare far better if a nuke was sent their way because they'd be able to see it coming. Really? How exactly do you think that's going to work? A lot of radar outposts along the ever-changing route between the two planets, are there? And then, Musk says, they would have time to stop the inbound missiles. Like, at what stage of colonization does Mars acquire planetary defense systems and missile deflectors? Are Starbuck and Apollo just hanging around in orbit to blast the fracking nukes out of the sky with their vipers? Or how does that work exactly? And just to wrap up the disconnected thought processes here, if Mars had a planetary defense system, what's stopping the moon from building one as well? That's no moon. There was absolutely no logic or intelligence in what Musk blurted out here at all. But he continues, and it does not get any better. I mean, it's a fixer-upper of a planet. Okay, needs some work, but it's, it's really the only option for becoming multiplanetary. And long term, we can warm up Mars, and we can there, there would be we can densify the atmosphere, and there'd be a liquid ocean on about forty percent of the surface. So it, we could make it an Earth-like planet uh, long term. This is one of the most overused lines that Musk throws around, and it really shows how Musk has zero clue about both Mars and home renovations. A fixer-upper home is one that was at one point livable and can be renovated into a proper home again. And even then, not every derelict home can be brought back. When looking at a renovation property, there's two things that you look for. An intact foundation is key. The second factor is what's called good bones. And the biggest giveaway for a home whose bones are tired is a saddle-backed roof line. If the roof is sagging, you're probably looking at a lot more work than one with a level peak. That being said, Mars has no bones at all. Nothing there to start with, nothing there to fix up, no materials available to use or build with, just rocks and smaller rocks and rocks that have been pulverized into dust. To point out the obvious, for example, there are no trees on Mars to provide lumber. Shocking, right? But even if you brought trees from Earth, there is no soil for them to grow in. Mars is covered with toxic pulverized rock with no nutrient value nor organics to retain moisture. But even if you brought enough soil from Earth for every tree, there's no microbiome available to sprout seeds or allow the root system of the tree to function by fixating nutrients. 
But even if you brought the microbiome from Earth and cultivated it, there is no nitrogen or other fertilizer compounds on Mars that trees require to facilitate the functions of a plant, such as producing chlorophyll, which they require for photosynthesis. But even if you brought nitrogen and fertilizer from Earth, there is precious little carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the plants to feed upon, in an atmosphere that is 0.6% as dense as Earth, nor any of the other nutrients and organisms that trees require to grow. Also, the sun's energy is depleted by 40% by the time it reaches Mars. Then there's the liquid water issue and the fact that water and regolith on Mars are contaminated with perchlorate salts. There's the temperature fluctuations and the radiation at the surface compared to Earth. Long story short, Mars is not a fixer-upper of a planet. It is a rocky, toxic, barren, irradiated wasteland. And that is all it is ever going to be. Now, when Musk says we can warm up the planet to densify the atmosphere, what he means is using 10,000 nuclear warheads detonated over the planet poles to create miniature suns. A plan that NASA and actual smart people have thoroughly debunked. Same thing with the liquid oceans that Musk says would cover 40% of the planet. That is not in the cards. Someone really needs to find Musk's VHS copy of Total Recall and burn it after telling Musk that this is not a documentary. Although, to be fair on the topic of movies, thanks to Musk and his followers, we're beginning to think that idiocracy was prescient in predicting the short-term future of humankind. The next item on the agenda was to use the flight record of Falcon to predict the future success of Starship. And as we mentioned, we don't even allow that argument in Twitter debates, so we're not giving this any further air here. Suffice to say, these two systems are entirely different and unique, and are therefore unrelated and will suffer their own fate. Skipping forward now to about 20 minutes in, Musk brings up a graphic showing the current lineup of vehicles available at SpaceX. Although, if we're not mistaken, Falcon 1 has been retired since 2009, so 15 years ago. Stopping here for a second, we're going to pick on the attention to detail in this drawing. We're assuming that they meant it to be the scale, hence the teeny tiny human over here on the left, which is obviously there to demonstrate how large the various rockets are. Too bad it is not to scale. See, the human in the 1920 by 1080 resolution measures 8 pixels tall. Apologies for making you squint, but that is the biggest we could blow it up from the screenshot at 400%. In comparison, the 9 meter wide starship in the same graphic measures 54 pixels across, the math coming in at 6 pixels per meter. So the 8 pixel human depicted here would only be 1.3 meters tall, just a little over 4 feet off by a factor of about 50%, and the reason it was done that way is obvious. Musk wants people to think that the Starship has plenty of room for the 100 people that he plans on stuffing in there on their way to Mars. But for us to correct that error, Starship would have to be knocked down by a third of its scale, and of course they would not have access to the entire length of the ship, so take away the propellant tanks and the engines from the diagram, and this would be more like it. But if we do a close-up of the hollowed out pressurized area of a starship and add in 100 six-foot astronauts to scale, this would be a far more accurate depiction. At 1.8 meters each, it takes five of them to get across the nine meter span. Then after you stuff all these people into this compartment, you still need to build decks, sleeping quarters, airlocks, food stores, water stores, and life support along with everything else that a self-contained passenger vessel is going to need to have on board for the entire voyage. Here we are getting into the city on Mars claims. If things go according to plan, uh, SpaceX will do probably 90% of all Earth mass to orbit. And then China will do about 6% and the rest of the world will do about 4%, uh, which is pretty wild. And then once Starship is flying, uh, we'll be doing over 99% of all Earth mass to orbit which you kind of have to do in order to uh, build a city on Mars. And, and I should say, we'll also build a, a, a lunar base as well. So, so it might as well, along the way. Ignoring the Earth to Mars percentage claims for now, the fact that Musk believes he could build a moon base just for the hell of it, while SpaceX is building their domed megalopolis on Mars, just shows how disconnected he is from reality. And it should be noted, that Musk has no permission nor contract to even consider building such a base. And at this point, they're so far behind on HLS proper that any additional contracts should most certainly be avoided until further notice. Starship itself at present has yet to successfully complete a single lap around the planet. 
Yet it does not stop Musk from making claims like this. Starship in its final configuration or its final form will probably do well over 200 tons to orbit w with full reusability and be able to fly you know, multiple times a day. So, please clap. Starship flying several times per day is simply not going to happen, especially when Musk is talking about using the same unique vehicle. This is very similar to claims that both Elon Musk and Gwen Shotwell have made about Falcon. Like in 2018, when Gwen told investors and customers in attendance these lines of nonsense. Reusability, we don't believe it really, really counts unless you can turn it around as rapidly or almost as rapidly as you turn around an aircraft. Basically, you land the, you land the system, you land the stage, you do some brief but important critical checks and inspections, you refuel and you re-go. So our challenge right now is to refly a rocket within, within 24 hours. So that's, uh, that's when we'll really feel like we got the reusability piece right. According to Shotwell, they don't have reliability down pat on Falcon until they can flip a rocket in 24 hours. Current record from April of 2022 is Booster 1062 with a turnaround time of 21 days, 6 hours. And the pad turnaround on that launch was 8 days. Musk is now saying multiple times per day on a much larger craft with a much larger proposed payload. It simply does not hold water. At around the 22 minute mark, Musk shows a one minute animation of the super heavy recovery using chopsticks. And this was the crowd's reaction to the video. So I, I'm pretty confident we will achieve that this year. Like I said, probably 80, 90% uh, this year. And now Musk has a similar prediction for Starship as he made earlier about the booster with regards to upcoming flights and targets. Here are the highlights of all the claims being made about Starship for upcoming launches. And then there's recovering and reusing the ship. So the ship, I think we will want to have uh, at least two consecutive successes of a given design land at a specific point in the ocean or smash into a specific point of the ocean before we try to bring it back to the launch site. My guess is probably next year is when we will be able to reuse Starship, but I think it's, it's, I think it's highly likely that this year we will bring Starship to a controlled point in the ocean and have it basically land on a virtual tower in somewhere in the, in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean. Uh, and the crowd responded throughout as if they'd heard it all before. Then at around 24 minutes in, Musk talks about his plans for Mechazilla. And we're going to build more Mechazillas. So there's going to be two launch towers here, and then two launch towers at the Cape as well. So we'll have uh, four launch towers for Starship, probably you know, by sometime next year. So uh, we're aiming to have the first Cape uh, launch tower and launch system operational around the middle of next year. And that'll be important for launch azimuths that are sort of fly over land. Um. Not sure if you've noticed, but Musk is really stacking up the promises for things to happen next year, isn't he? Two launch towers in Boca Chica and two more at the Cape, he says. But there's a fairly big issue with this claim that the launch towers in Florida will be operational by the middle of next year, as in 2025. See, according to this Air Force Department notice, they have only just filed their intent to prepare an environmental impact statement for SpaceX Starship Super Heavy Operations at Canaveral. That was filed February 21st of 2024. Document number 2024-03554. The proposed dates of note are notice of availability for the draft EIS anticipated December of 2024, NOA for the final EIS in September of 2025, with a final decision made no earlier than 30 days afterwards, taking it into October, possibly November of 2025. That alone puts the claims Musk is making about operational Florida Mechazillas by mid-2025 in doubt. But while we're here, let's ask this question because nobody has answered it yet. If you launch a tanker-booster combo to orbit, and the booster comes back to the tower to land to go again. Where exactly is the tanker supposed to go when it's ready to return to the tower? That tower is already occupied. In that landing animation that Musk shows of the booster coming back, there is no other booster nor starship in the area. How are they going to handle that? Musk then tells his people in Boca Chica how he expects the launch program to pan out. 
what, what we should probably expect is that we do the kind of the development launches here, test anything new here, build the rockets, and then uh, probably most of the operational launches would be from the Cape. Well, that's quite a quick reversal, isn't it? Musk was just telling people how Boca Chica was going to be the gateway to Mars. We're basically on a sand spit. That is actually the gateway to Mars. And not 30 seconds ago was saying how they were going to have four launch towers for Starship between the two locations. So there's going to be two launch towers here and then two launch towers at the Cape as well. So we'll have four launch towers for Starship. But is now saying that most operational launches will be happening from the Cape. Test anything new here, build the, build the rockets, and then uh, probably most of the operational launches would be from the Cape. So why exactly is this ecologically sensitive and important sand spit in Boca Chica at the mouth of the Rio Grande being industrialized when the majority of the vehicles produced here are never going to launch from here anyway? For the next bit, pay attention to what Musk is saying about the number of boosters versus the number of ships. Ultimately, we'll need to build a lot more ships than boosters, especially for Mars, because it's at the, you'll actually want to use the ship take apart the ship and use it for raw materials on Mars because the ship materials will be so valuable. You, mo most of the ships you wouldn't want to bring back, you'd want to just use them for raw materials. Eventually we will want to bring ships back and I think we want to give people the option of coming back because they're more likely to want to go if there's some option of coming back. This is kind of like the Martian colonist version of having your cake and eating it too. He says you're going to need to strip the vehicles down for the raw materials, but also people are going to want to go back to Earth. Those two options would appear to be simultaneously incompatible. For example, if you were to do, as the diagram from International Space University suggests, and lay the vehicle on its side, then cover it with regolith to make it into a suitable habitat, that is going to cost you the return trip home. You cannot do both. Which means that when Musk has stated in the past that the return ticket home to Earth would be free for anyone who went, he was already promising things that he could not possibly deliver on once the starships are disassembled. But he seems to be perfectly comfortable with that. But I think most of, most of the people that go to Mars will probably never come back to Earth. So, and we'll need to ramp uh, production to pretty high numbers. Like, uh, I think ultimately probably a ship every, like multiple ships per day, basically. Um, now to clarify here, Musk is not talking about the launch rate of Starship at this point. He's talking about building multiple ships per day. Interplanetary rockets, each entrusted with the lives of 100 paying customers, getting slapped together in a matter of hours. What could possibly go wrong? And uh, the next year we're aiming to demonstrate ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer. Um... So again, next year, Musk predicts that SpaceX will finally be able to demonstrate on-orbit propellant transfer, only five years after taking that contract from NASA, and three years after the contract was supposed to be completed, meaning proven. One thing we're going to point out here is that the video attached to this detailing of the contract dates had the Starship and the tanker mated tail to tail, as that was the original ill-conceived concept. Our episode 5, from almost four years ago on orbital refueling, used that model and went through many issues we saw with not only that configuration, but also the concept in general. And very shortly after that, the company released a new model, as shown here, side to side, even though it still only exists as a CGI. Crowd is falling asleep at this point. Let's pull out the juvenile sexual humor. It's, it's hard to make this not look a little bit naughty, uh, <laughs> because it's two ships connecting and doing a fluid transfer. No, nothing. Keep going. Um, but it is, this is actually a very important, uh, this is a very important step on going to Mars because you need to put, to get the ship to orbit and then do orbital refilling. That's really, you, you'll need about, about five or six uh, refilling missions for every one mission that goes to Mars. So roughly five to one. What was that he said? Five to six refilling missions for every ship heading to Mars? Sorry, bud. Anybody paying attention to announcements of late 
it is aware that NASA believes each mission headed to the moon, obviously a much closer destination, is expected to take up to 20 refilling loads before heading to the moon, and possibly more depending on boil off rate. But with a straight face, you're going to tell the people who work for you that a trip to Mars will take 75% fewer tanker loads? No wonder they're not clapping. So, and, and this will also be very important for the Artemis program for the NASA to, to get back to the moon. So we'll want to have a ship that is, uh, well, it's going to be a specialized ship for the moon. So the moon, obviously, there's no Mechazilla, so we need la landing legs. And uh, you don't need a heat shield and uh, you don't need flaps because there's no atmosphere. So the moon ship would be specialized. Now, ultimately, I think we, w we want to build a moon base, moon base alpha. At least he finally remembered that he has a contract to get NASA back to the moon. But again, this is mentioned only as a throwaway, when that really should be the only focus for the company at this juncture, as they are well behind schedule. Boosts were supposed to be on the moon three months ago, in January 2024, according to the original $3 billion Option A contract that SpaceX was awarded. But rather than go into how far along the development line they are with HLS, Musk is already looking forward to his moon base alpha that nobody has given him permission or contract to build. Um, and have a permanently uh, occupied uh, base on the moon. Like that would be super exciting. And so you'd have a bunch of ships that are specialized for going to and from the moon, but they never come back to, they never land back on Earth. They just would would uh, dock with uh, propellant, propellant tankers to get uh, orbital refilling. Musk is talking about propellant tankers for the HLS version of Starship to refill again in orbit around the moon. And we'd like to know where on the Artemis diagram Musk included those ships because they don't appear to be anywhere on here or on here either. Probably just an oversight. Time for a comparison between three versions of Raptors. The Raptor 1, which has been cancelled, in favor of Raptor 2, which has yet to prove its reliability, having not successfully relit as required during IFT3. Looking forward to the third iteration of Raptor. The booster engines will, will aim to get the booster engines over 330 tons of thrust, which would mean 10,000 tons of total thrust at liftoff. Raptor 3 also will not need a heat shield. So Ra Raptor 3 looks, looks very simple, and it is actually simplified in a lot of ways. But a lot of the complexity is hidden because we have integral cooling channels uh, in, in many parts of the engine that, that don't exist in Raptor 2. Raptor 3 looks like it's missing a bunch of parts, but actually those parts have either been deleted or they've been integrated into the system, and like I said, with integral cooling channels. But it will be easy to integrate and will have higher performance and lower total mass and be more reliable. So. That last little bit that Musk threw in there would confirm what many have suspected, that Raptor 2 has reliability issues that Raptor 3 is meant to fix. So there's a couple questions that come to mind right off the bat. One is, if the engines can be stripped down like that and still function the same, why were they so complex to begin with? It's not like building rocket engines is a new technology. Two, if the external components and channels are now being integrated into and hidden within the machine, how much more difficult are they going to be to check and service? And three, are they aware that making rocket engines this way flies directly in the face of the NASA document SB-287? What made Apollo a success? Where one of the items specifically mentioned in the Keep It Simple philosophy was ablative heat shielding that did not require regenerative cooling. From the bottom of the introduction page, the author, George Blow, writes under the heading of Spacecraft Design. The principles of manned spacecraft design involve a combination of aircraft design practice and elements of missile design technology. Build it simple, then double up on many components of systems so that if one fails, the other will take over. Examples are ablative thrust chambers that do not require regenerative cooling, hypergolic propellants that do not require an ignition source, and three fuel cells where one alone could bring the spacecraft back from the moon. And he continues on from there. Starship actually ignores all three of those criteria, as well as the overarching concept of redundancy. Musk moves into another series of frames which show how the next iteration of Starship is going to outperform the one currently being worked on. Apparently, the booster is going to grow by over a meter, and the mission vehicle by two. Total height increase compared to IFT3 is over three meters, or about 10 feet. 
A quick look at the chart confirms that extra ring or two is to accommodate a larger set of propellant tanks in each half of the integrated unit. 300 more tons of propellant in Starship, 350 more tons in the booster. Musk says this about the differences between the two systems. So Starship 2, we're aiming for, like I currently flight three would be around 40 or 50 tons to orbit. Right, so the current design, Starship 2 will be over 100 tons. So even though the slide intentionally omitted known information, Musk can't help himself and states that the current design of Starship would only take 40 or 50 tons to orbit, completely undermining every other payload claim made about this craft to date. But now, apparently Starship 2 will be able to make good on the 100 tons claim that has been made since 2019. Just as a quick note of reference, going back to this frame, that means that the Falcon Heavy is capable of outperforming the current design of Starship by over 14 tons. Figured that's worth mentioning. But wait, there's more. There's also a Starship 3 introduction, and this one has stretched out to 150 meters tall combined vehicle length. The ship propellant tanks have doubled in size from IFT-3, probably to accommodate the three extra vacuum raptors in the design, now promising a 200 ton to orbit payload deployment. Although that looks and sounds far more impressive. Keep this in mind. Musk has been promising this craft will deliver 100 people to Mars per vehicle per trip. If each of those people comes on board with one ton of food, which is what the astronauts on the ISS consume each per year, and a personal one ton tote of water, that vehicle will already be overweight by the weight of the astronauts, and you haven't even added a single roll of toilet paper to the manifest yet. Logistics matter. Failing to plan is planning to fail. That should almost be SpaceX's motto by now. But the best thing about this monster ship is the low, low cost to build it. And then Starship 3 will be over 200 tons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. At, at 200 tons per flight, fully reusable, um, that, is, that is pretty incredible. This will be on the order of 500 feet tall. One of the most profound things is Starship 3 will cost less per flight than Falcon 1. So that's the difference between if you've got a fully reusable rocket or an expendable rocket. Um, the fully reusable rocket with low cost propellant and autogenous pressurization uh, actually costs less than a, a, a tiny expendable rocket. The Starship 3 will be 400 times more payload for less than the cost of a Falcon 1. So according to Musk, the bigger version of this vehicle is going to cost less than this tiny rocket based on the fact that it's reusable. Except, didn't we just cover the fact that Starship's going to Mars are going to be stripped down for the raw materials? That's not a reusable rocket then, is it? So how much is it actually going to cost to not only build, but to outfit, as necessary, a Starship that can keep 100 people alive for the entire time that they are off-world? And then the ages-old per-launch cost claim comes back like a blast from the past. Ultimately, I think we, we might be able to get the cost per flight to Earth orbit down around $2 million or $3 million. Uh, th these are sort of unthinkable numbers uh, from the, you know, no, nobody ever thought that this was possible, but we're not breaking any physics to achieve this. That's what Musk has been saying for years, probably since the very beginning when this was still the MCT or the BFR. And yet the Falcon 9, whose boosters are reused fairly reliably at this point, and the Dragon crew capsules still cost orders of magnitude more than that per launch. Astronauts are paying between 55 and 88 million dollars each to get to the ISS aboard Crew Dragon using reflown equipment. SpaceX needs to stop making this launch cost claim until after it is a feat they have actually accomplished that can be verified by outside auditors. Otherwise, the cost, the abilities, the payload estimations should all be considered completely aspirational. Meanwhile, the Starship record for completed missions is still zero for three. But the claims that are coming up next go right back to the very beginning of this channel. The absurd claims about taking humans to Mars that created the arguments in our very first episodes. Musk has learned nothing in those four years, apparently. 
and neither has anybody that still believes his fantasy. So every, roughly every two years, thousands of ships would depart from Earth to Mars. It would look like Battlestar Galactica, but in a good way, you know. Hopefully w without being chased by the Cylons. But uh, it would be an incredible thing to see these thousands of ships departing every, every 26 months for Mars. First off, for every ship that is headed to Mars, you're looking at 20 refilling flights per manned or cargo vessel, not the three tankers that Musk disingenuously shows in the next frame. To make it more accurate, the graphic should look like this, per manned ship. Second, at what point are the colonists going to board the ship that is not human rated to begin with? Are we pretending they're launching to orbit in the Starship? Let's presume so. These ships, according to Musk, are launching to orbit to queue up and convoy to Mars. What duration of time are these people expected to hang out in orbit, eating food stores, using up their water, losing muscle mass, with calcium leaching out of their bones into their kidneys as their hearts shrink? And what is the cadence that Musk is contemplating for this process? Because the 100,000 people that he's planning on taking for each opportunity can't all go up last. What this diagram is basically saying is that uh, for getting to Mars, we would um, create a kind of a propellant depot ship. The propellant depot would look more like a hot dog than like a sphere. It's really just a, a long ship with a lot of insulation. So a propellant depot ship shaped like a hot dog, which hasn't been built and presumably wouldn't be any bigger than the Starship 2 design. Musk is acting like one such ship would accommodate the entirety of the fleet. The fact is, such a depot would likely only be capable of filling up one single ship. We'd fill that ship up, and then as, as they're going to Mars, the ships would take off with, I don't know, a couple hundred tons of payload from Earth, reach orbit with very, almost no propellant, get refilled by the tanker, uh, and then go to Mars and, and land, go all the way to Mars with over 200 tons of useful payload. So now, each manned vessel is going to require its own propellant depot in orbit as well because as you can see in the diagram, once the tanker is done, it's supposed to fall back to Earth for reasons we'd like to hear. Why wouldn't you just leave it there for the next convoy staging? Then on Mars, at, in the beginning, we would, I think we would simply reuse the ship materials. So most of the ships wouldn't come back, but then over time, you'd want to bring the ships back so you could reuse them. Here's brass tacks on the stripping down of a starship for base materials. You would have to be insane to even attempt that. You have an intact habitat with presumably a sealed integrated life support system that would double as your escape raft off the planet provided you had propellant in the tank. You're going to gut it to build what exactly? And where is your intermediate step? You'd be rendering the ship uninhabitable long before you could take those same materials and build something else with it. So what hotel are you going to be staying at in the meantime? And, um, and for that, we would need to create uh, methane, CH4, and oxygen O2 on Mars, which you can do with uh, H2O and CO2. So the atmosphere is CO2, and there's plenty of water ice, H2O. So it's, it's kind of like the reason we have a methane oxygen system is because you can make methane and oxygen on Mars fairly easily. The ingredients are red readily available to create methane and oxygen on Mars. So. The concept of ISRU, in situ resource utilization on Mars, was covered in depth by this channel two years ago. We stripped that process down to the bare bones, determining what equipment would be required, what amount of energy, how large you would need to make your solar panel field, and for a single starship, the requirements were insane. Marspedia did a similar workup, breaking their findings down into a single page flowchart, outlining the processes, storage requirements, the whole nine yards. And their numbers put our breakdown right in the ballpark. Given the requirements of ISRU, Musk is not going to be refilling propellants for Starship on Mars. And one of the reasons why you know that's not going to happen is because he's still not making propellants using an in-situ process on Earth at Boca Chica like he told Tim Dodd he was going to do where thicker air, ample water, and stronger solar irradiance are available for that process. This is not fairly easy, as he claims. Not even on Earth. One more example of Musk not having the slightest clue about what he's proposing. But get ready for some more recycled nonsense. So you build a propellant depot and, and bring the ships back and build out, as quickly as possible, a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. 
We want to get the cost of going to Mars such that almost anyone could afford it. Like if somebody were to just work hard on Earth, save up, and that they'd be able to go to Mars. And I think you'll see a lot of governments also sponsor people, and ultimately we'll, we'll want to get to... Uh... He's gone back to promoting Mars as a tourist destination, with tickets cheap enough for anybody to afford. And he thinks the governments would pay for ordinary people to go there as well. Despite Musk declaring that SpaceX will make up its own laws on Mars in violation of international treaties. How cheap is he talking per ticket? Well, back in the early days, where he seems to be taking this set of talking points from, Musk had originally mentioned $500,000 per ticket, then later on $200,000 per ticket, possibly going down to $100,000. And we can destroy that claim with one simple statement. Everybody that goes to Mars is going to require a custom tailored spacesuit. In fact, at least one and spare parts. Want to guess how much those cost? Let's put it this way. For the Artemis missions, NASA isn't even buying the suits they need from the manufacturer, Axiom Space. They're going to rent them instead. So the price per ticket that Musk is suggesting would not even cover the cost of this bare necessity of living off world. Next up, where is Musk planning to land his Battlestar Galactica fleet? So there's uh, kind of an optimal landing zone on Mars where you have resources, so you've got access to water or frozen water that you're not too close to the poles so you can use solar power. It would be nice to use nuclear. I don't know if we'll get, get the approval, but nuclear would be very handy on Mars because you can use the heat and you can generate electricity. So Musk isn't even sure he can get permission from the powers that be to bring nuclear power reactors to Mars, but he's still pumping the Nuke Mars Earthification Plan. Got it. Probably easier to track down a Genesis device or alien artifact anyway. And then uh, you kind of want to be about two kilometers below sea level. <laughs> so if Mars did have an ocean, you'd actually be quite deep in the ocean, at least at first. You kind of want to land halfway between the pole and the equator in, in a, a deep area of Mars. The deeper it is, the more you can use the atmosphere to break, and the atmospheric density is higher. A couple of things in this one statement. First, Preferential future landing sites on Mars have already been determined by NASA, and most of them are certainly not halfway between the equator and the poles. They're hugging the equator tighter than that, with one exception in the upper left on this map. And as for the claim that Starship would be using the atmosphere on Mars to slow their speed on approach, let's go back to IFT-3. The speed of SN-28 just before entering Earth's atmosphere, which is 160 times thicker than that of Mars, at an elevation of 100 kilometers was running around 26,700 kilometers per hour when the plasma glow on the port fin started up. When the signal on SN-28 was lost at around 4940, the ship had already dropped through one-third of the atmosphere to 65 kilometers altitude, but had shed only 4% of its speed still running at 25,700 clicks and change, out of control, indicating that it was falling butt first. Not liking their chances of aerobraking this monstrosity on Mars, no matter what geological elevation they're targeting on the surface. Now, we have often wondered about the systems that Starship is going to require, and where SpaceX is on the development of those requirements. Here's your answer. These are all the things that would have to be developed. Sometimes people ask me, are we developing these things? I'm like, not yet, because uh, this is the cart and we need the horse first. So the rocket is the horse and then this is the cart. To clarify and nail the point home, they have not even started yet. Can't build the cart before the horse, apparently. Which is an odd thing to say when designing a spacecraft because that is, in fact, exactly what NASA does with their missions. They identify what cart is required as in, what are the mission parameters, and then they figure out how many horses they need to haul it. If the mission-specific craft they've designed outweighs the available horsepower, then they have to modify it until the horses can haul the cart. SpaceX is not doing things that way, but according to Musk, their failure to develop these systems by now opens up a new and exciting opportunity for entrepreneurs. But ultimately we'll need all these things, lots of power generation, mining in general, ice mining, propellant production, long duration life support, uh, a lot of construction, and, uh, and then global communication. So I think this would open up a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs that want to create any create things on Mars, whether that is a propellant, well, well, I think we'll have to do the propellant depot, but 
uh, whether it's uh, like iron ore refining or a pizza joint or a bar, you know, uh, there'll be an opportunity to do all the things that we like on Earth on Mars. Like a Mars bar would be, yeah. Okay, first, he thinks they might have to do the propellant depot themselves. How far behind in that development are they then? And second, claiming people can just move to and open up retail shops on Mars upon arrival is delusional, whether he's talking about now or in 20 years. And he used those same exact examples of a pizza shop and an iron ore refinery a decade ago in 2015 at an International Space Station conference. To use Musk's own example against him, contemplate all the ingredients required to bake this pie from killer pizza from Mars in Oceanside, California. Then remember that every one of those food items would have to be imported from Earth in supply runs that happen two years apart. If the logistical issues involved with this model are not apparent to you, then you should definitely buy a ticket and go. The fact that Musk is still using these points 10 years later is totally embarrassing and indicative of either someone who is completely scientifically illiterate or intentionally trying to deceive his audience or both. There is no position outside of those two that makes sense. So let's be totally honest here. This is all pure, unadulterated horseshit. Something else that Mars has no reserve of. Ordinary people will not buy tickets to move to Mars. Even the guy that ran the Mars One competition scam was bright enough to realize he was going to have to screen a field of applicants down to the most suitable candidates. Not everybody got to go. We covered this in another one of our early episodes where we compared living on a starship to living aboard a submarine and the stringent requirements for submariners to qualify for service, physical and mental testing required. We've also got a two-part series called Colonizing Mars, which expands further on the submariner episode into not only what kind of people might be considered to travel by starship, but also what kind of society they should plan on living in while on board and when they arrive on Mars and we can pretty much guarantee it will not be a democratic government ruling over a capitalistic free market. If you want to see what we came up with, these are the episodes to check out. Which brings us into the next CGI in Musk's presentation. I think probably the, a rough order of magnitude guess for what you need, how many people do you need for a self-sustaining city is about a million and several million tons of cargo. Uh, yeah. Which we can do, and we can do this in 20 years. But like I said, in order for it to be self-sustaining, you actually need the entire base of industry. You can't be missing any element. So that's really what's going to take a while is, do you have everything you need to survive on Mars? At that point, the future of consciousness is assured. If you want to see how absolutely ridiculous Musk is being with his million-person city claim, our episodes number three, Million People on Mars, and number six, Feeding the Colony, will very quickly set the record straight as to how insane such a proposition is. Again, this suggestion from Musk can be shut down immediately with this question. How many self-sustaining glassed-in domed cities of a million people are there on Earth, where industry and resources and labor are far more easily accessed? If you can't build a domed utopia, in the middle of the Sahara, or at the South Pole, you sure as hell are not building it on Mars. To be clear, this dome is already in Antarctica, but it does not hold a million people, nor is it anywhere near self-sufficient. But if you ever did try to pull that off, what million people are you going to let in, and what would that society look like? Just to help you visualize that population, here's a photo of Michigan Stadium. It holds 100,000 people. Musk is talking about housing, supporting, and feeding 10 times this number of people in a sealed, self-sufficient, urban environment. Musk is also suggesting that he is going to launch this number of people into orbit every two years in order to get them to Mars in the first place. And we're telling you he is insane if he actually believes that. The next clip is more aspirational numbers regarding shipping resources from Earth to Mars so they can create that self-sufficient city off-world. So if you do 10 launches a day at 200 tons per launch, a uh, million and a half tons to LEO per opportunity, you, you net that out to a quarter million tons 
uh, to Mars per opportunity. So that means you can get to, to a million tons in about eight years since the opportunities are two years apart. So I think this is pretty doable. And I'm like, we're actually going to do this. Are we just, well, I think, you know, we are actually going to do it, which is insane to think. So millions of tons to Mars. Again, we need to tackle a couple of things here. First, if Musk actually takes a million people to Mars, he is going to have to take millions of tons to Mars every 26 months and into eternity, just in food, because each one of those people is going to eat a ton of food per year. So every orbit transfer window, every 26 months, assuming population doesn't grow, he'd better have about 2.5 million tons of food lined up Otherwise, the million Martians are going to starve to death after the available meat runs out. Second, let's talk real numbers about those 10 launches per day. 10 launches a day at 200 tons per vehicle, as per Musk, to launch 250,000 tons to Mars per opportunity, as per the graphic. That's obviously for ships that are headed to Mars with payload. Remember, each one of those mission vehicles requires 20 logistic tanker launches to refill, so it is not 10 launches per day. It's 210 launches per day, minimum, flying from two launch towers at Cape Canaveral. Call it five launches per hour on each tower. Anybody seeing any issues with that? Apparently Musk doesn't. This is his plan. And this is the crowd's reaction to that plan. So, millions of tons to Mars. Stunned silence. Yeah. Wild. Um. But just to drop the grade of this presentation that much more, Musk flashes a frame up on the screen, comparing Starship rocket build rates to the output rate from his Tesla automobile factory. Of course, this is much bigger than a car, uh, but even if you look at the total tonnage, it's, it's still very, it's very doable to build several thousand vehicles a year. So that's what we need to do, and we're gonna do it. Just in case you're unaware, Tesla is not exactly the gold standard of automotive engineering excellence. Find them on this chart. Then guess what other long lost concept Musk brings back for seven and a half seconds. And then long term we'll probably have some offshore launch sites. Well here's news for the long term memory impaired. Musk already bought two platforms to modify into the graphics that you see here. He failed. Those two former oil platforms that he renamed Phobos and Deimos after the Greek gods of pain and panic, were bought in 2020 to great fanfare and then sold in near silence in February of 2023. By showing this graphic, inferring that it's a new idea, Musk is obviously hoping that the people watching him can't remember any of that. Now remember when we brought up the question of where the returning tanker was going to land at the ground-based launch sites when the launch tower had already received Super Heavy? Yeah, they really don't put that much thought into this anymore. Musk wraps up the visual presentation with another viewing of the old Mars landing video. And again, this is the crowd's reaction. All right, so we're actually gonna do this. Um... 30 seconds later, Musk wraps it up and his stone cold audience applauds one last time because they can finally go home. <laughs> Wrapping it all up, Musk promised the audience an update on the company's plans to making humanity multiplanetary. He failed miserably. There was no new information here. Anyone following Musk for any length of time has heard everything in here before, with the exception of the as yet unveiled Starship 2 and Raptor 3. The presumption appears to be that Musk is going to fix Starship by simply making it bigger, and there's no reason to believe that's going to be the outcome. The claims about the ship, about the city on Mars, about the preservation of the light of consciousness, are all recycled, easily debunked nonsense. And everybody in that crowd knew it. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. It would be really great if we had a system in place that had a chance of taking humans to Mars in our lifetime. But the more that Musk speaks, the more obvious it becomes that SpaceX is not going to be the company to get us there. Hopefully, there are other companies in the wings that are designing a better mission with a grasp on reality. 
maybe one that will be content with getting a four-person crew to and from the planet in a three-year arc, such as NASA had in reserve years ago. That might be something we could get behind and support. Instead of the recycled rubbish that comes out of Boca Chica every time Musk misses a home and transfer orbit opportunity. If you have any comments to make about the material we covered, that's what the comments section is for. Please leave your comments, questions, and thumbs up on the episode, then share it with your friends. A special thank you to our patrons on Patreon who help this channel a great deal with their direct support of our productions. If you'd like to join our membership, visit patreon.com slash the common sense skeptic. We also have one-time donation links at GoFundMe and buymeacoffee.com. The other best way you can support the channel is to make sure you're subscribed and ring that notification bell so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns. <laughs>